Hello, I'm Tom Long. I have a question for you. Have you ever said something to someone and as soon as you saw the expression on their face, you knew that they had taken what you had said differently from what you had meant to be telling them? <laughs> and it, it can be pretty awkward sometimes. But you should know, you're not the first person to have that experience. In fact, the best person who ever lived on earth had the same problem when talking to other people. And today, we're gonna to look at how that went down. This is the fifth and last Sunday that the lectionary has taken a side road from the gospel readings in Mark to gospel readings in John. I really love John's gospel and his epistles, but some parts of the gospel, like the end of Jesus' bread of life discourse, can be real head scratchers. Remember in chapter 3, when Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, a man, I assume, to have some intellectual prowess, he just didn't track with what Jesus was saying. Jesus told him that he must be born again, and Nicodemus was like, so a grown man like me is supposed to crawl into his mother's womb and come out again? Jesus, what are you talking about? And Jesus went on to explain that he meant that just as he had been physically born, Nicodemus also needed to be spiritually born. He wasn't speaking literally. I remember an experience I had as a teenager. One of my classmates invited a group of us to go hear her father preach. My family was not church going, and most of my exposure had been VBS, and campground Vesper services that my aunt and uncle took me to. This girl's dad was preaching from Matthew chapter 18. He told us that Jesus said, and if thine eye cause thee to fall, pluck it out and cast it from thee. And when he said, pluck it out, he gestured with his hand like he was pulling his eye out of his eye socket for an unforgettable split second. I was terrified because I thought he had actually plucked his own eye out. My point being that Jesus had a way of saying things that A, would make a person sit up and take notice, and B, might come across as offensive or shocking. <laughs> this week's reading from John begins the way that last week's reading ended. Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Cannibalism, anybody? I don't know whether it was the shocking words of that verse or that he said in verse 57, the living father sent me, claiming to have come down from heaven. But there were a lot of people who took what he said the wrong way. The Bible tells us many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And that from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. While Jesus did mean that he came down from heaven, he didn't mean that we were literally to eat his body and drink his blood. As soon as Jesus said for them to eat his body and drink his blood, I think a lot of people went into shock and missed the words that followed. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. In our passage, we'll consider two words John uses over and over again in his gospel. The one we see in this verse is meno. The NIV trans translation goes with remain in this verse, but meno can also be translated abide, stay, or live in the same dwelling. It's a word that speaks to a deep, intimate, familial relationship. When we metaphorically eat his flesh and drink his blood, we take him into our lives at a very deep and personal level. We dwell in him and he dwells in us. Another one of John's thematic words is life. We see it repeatedly used here as both a noun and a verb. We start out with Jesus talking about the living father who sent him. But we who internalize all that Jesus is feeding us also live. 
Now again, we have to avoid the Nicodemus pitfall and not take this word in the sense of literal physical life, even though that too is a gift of God. But Jesus is here talking about being fully alive to the core of our made in the image of God's souls. In Christ and in the power of Christ, those who receive Jesus in the deep sense he has been talking about, we now live this God-sourced level of life that can only be experienced in Christ. Look, as an American Baptist, I believe deeply in your right to choose to believe any religion or no religion. But I won't let ecumenism rob these words of their power. Who lives in the way Jesus is talking about? He says, the one who feeds on me will live because of me, unquote. Jesus is life. He says this explicitly in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The living Father sent Jesus to us to bring us this life that is in God. I'm reminded of a line from A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway wrote, Why, darling, I don't live at all when I'm not with you. <laughs> His character Catherine is not saying that she's a corpse when they are separated. She is saying she isn't fully alive. And like the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, it is a picture of how we believers are only fully living when we are connected to God through Jesus. The energy, the quality, the connection that this life represents is so powerful that even the passing of our mortal bodies cannot quench this life. In this sense, it is an eternal life. So some stumbled on eats my flesh and drinks my blood. They turned back and no longer followed him. But Jesus returns to the apostles and asks them whether they are offended. He reminds them that the words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. John began his gospel by telling us that Jesus is the Word that is God. And Jesus says here that his words are full of the Spirit and life. Then Jesus asks his apostles, you do not want to leave me too, do you? When we consider the offer of the good news of life in Christ, we must each decide. Will we eat his flesh and drink his blood? Will we take him and his life words into our hearts as the life that sustains us? Or will we choose to be among those who leave? Peter had already had a taste of this life Jesus was talking about. He already believed and knew from where Jesus had really come, the living God. I hope that my own spirit responds to Christ's invitation as Peter's did. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. There are people making pilgrimages in search of a deeper, fuller, more transcendent life experience. But Jesus is saying, and Peter is affirming, that we need go nowhere else or look any further than to come to the living God through Jesus Christ. Where will you go to really live? My choice is to go to the Lord and to the Lord alone.